Now, Iran says that Israel will pay for the assassination of Hamas's top political leader, Ismail Haniya. He was killed in an airstrike in Tehran. Thousands gathered in the Iranian capital for a funeral honoring the leader of the Palestinian party and militant group Hamas. Haniya was also the chief negotiator in talks aimed at reaching a ceasefire with Israel. Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei spoke at the ceremony. Iran holds Israel responsible for the killing and said they will make Israel regret the move. Well, Israel says it can now confirm that it killed Hamas's military leader, Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Daif, in an airstrike in Gaza last month. The Israeli military says Daif was killed on the 13th of July in a strike on the outskirts of Khan Yunus. Daif, uh, Daif is considered one of the planners of the October 7th attacks against Israel last year. Israel's military had been hunting the extremely secretive 57-year-old for decades. DW's Rebecca Ritters in Jerusalem told us more. Well, Mohammed Dave was the head of the military wing, the Al Qassam Brigades in Gaza. He uh, has was heading up that uh, the Al Qassam Brigades for some decades, a couple of decades, and, and with with the organisation for around about 30 years. He's long been on Israel's wanted list, and in fact, in May, Karim Khan, the head, chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court, put him on a list of Hamas leaders that uh, he was applying to have uh, arrest warrants. Uh, handed out to Ismail Haniyeh being another person who was on that list, as well as Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in Gaza. Uh, as I said, he was long on the wanted list of Israel, and Israel made several attempts at his life. Uh, he was unsuccessful. He remained elusive until, uh, as we're now learning, on July 13th, when he was targeted alongside another senior Hamas figure, Rafa Salameh, leader of Hamas forces in Khan Yunus. Uh, now, it was confirmed on the day that Salameh had been killed, but they, the Israeli military weren't 100% certain uh, that Daif also was killed in that airstrike. They, they thought that it was po possible, probable, but they, they didn't have the intelligence. They are now saying they do have the intelligence to confirm that he was taken out in that airstrike, but it should be said that uh, some 90 other people in Gaza were also uh, killed in that strike because it was in an area in Khan Yunus near, uh, you know, this area where people had gone uh, to shelter. Um, so Hamas has d denied, or before fine, before today, they certainly were denying that Daif was uh, killed in that attack, but we haven't heard from them uh, in the aftermath of this, this latest development. Assuming Daif is dead, how big of a blow would this be to Hamas's capabilities in Gaza? Oh, it's certainly a very big symbolic and strategic blow to Hamas. Daif was uh, a very key figure and he certainly played an important role on the ground uh, in Gaza. He, you know, was, was certainly thought to have coordinated many attacks against Israelis and was seen as a mastermind behind the October 7 attacks. He was very close with uh, the Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar in Gaza and he was you know, had this almost heroic status. As I said, he was a very elusive figure. There were only three known photographs of the man. And so, you know, he had a kind of a, a godlike uh, symbolism around him. And so it will be a very strategic and symbolic loss for Hamas. He had built up a lot of expertise over the years. He was instrumental in uh, building the, the underground tunnel network and, of course, also the, the bomb-making program that Hamas have, you know, the, their capabilities when it comes to, to making bombs. So he certainly is going to be uh, a big loss to uh, the network. But, you know, these figures are not irreplaceable. And we've seen that in the past, that, that key figures uh, have been able to be replaced. And Hamas is, as many say, an ideology. And this armed struggle will not be over just because uh, Mohammed Dave has been killed. So a blow to Hamas's capabilities nonetheless. Uh, how was all this playing out then for Israel's leader, Benjamin Netanyahu? 
Well, these assassinations are certainly being seen in Israel and they're certainly being sold by Benjamin Netanyahu and the government as wins. Uh, you know, we, we heard Benjamin Netanyahu speak about it in his address to the nation yesterday, saying these military gains uh, you know, would not have been possible if he had bowed to public pressure uh, and taken a hostage deal or taken some kind of ceasefire arrangement, that he was sticking to his plan, that he's been saying all along only... Uh, the war will end when total victory uh, is made, when he's able to, to completely dismantle Hamas as an organisation and, and as an organisation that can have any military strength against Israel. That is something that they will, you know, certainly trying to sell that the assassination of these key leaders, although we have to remember that they haven't claimed responsibility for the assassination of the political leader Ismail Haniyeh, though it is widely regarded that that, that was also uh, at the hands of Israel. They're definitely being sold as a win, but we'll just have to see what the next steps are and the retaliation from Iran and its proxies, just where Benjamin Netanyahu will be standing in the weeks to come. Rebecca, thanks for that update. Our correspondent, Rebecca Ritters, in Jerusalem. Well, the motivation for killing Ismail Haniyeh, the Hamas leader, may stem from the group's October 7th terror attacks in Israel, but the animosity towards Haniyeh stretches back much further, as we see in this report. Ismail Haniyeh greets Iran's new president in what would be one of his last meetings. Just hours after attending the president's inauguration, he and his bodyguard were killed in a strike on his residence in Tehran. Haniyeh was the political face of Hamas, the militant Islamist group that carried out the October 7th terror attacks on Israel. Haniyeh had not lived in Gaza for several years, but ran Hamas from Qatar, where he lived in exile. He became the Palestinian Prime Minister in 2006 and continued to rise through Hamas's ranks, eventually becoming its political chief in 2017. Hamas's Gaza leader, Yahya Sinwar, is believed to have been the mastermind of the October 7th attacks, while Haniya represented Hamas internationally and moved around the region for diplomatic meetings. He was a key player in negotiations to stop the fighting in Gaza. Some fear his killing will be a major setback to achieving peace in the region. Haniyeh's death came just hours after Israel said it killed senior Hezbollah commander Fuad Shukur in Beirut. The attack also killed at least one woman and two children and wounded dozens. Israel says it targeted Shukur in retaliation for a rocket attack on a soccer field in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights that killed 12 children and teenagers. Israel blamed Hezbollah and warned the militant group it would pay a heavy price. Shukur had been one of Hezbollah's leading military figures since it was established by Iran's Revolutionary Guard more than four decades ago. After the Israel-Hamas war broke out on October 7th, Shukur was accused by Israel of being behind many of the drone and missile attacks that Hezbollah launched against Israel. Shukur is the most senior Hezbollah commander to be killed since 2016, when Mustafa Badreddin, the group's military commander in Syria, died in an explosion in Damascus. Global leaders fear the deaths of two senior leaders of Israel's greatest enemies, when tensions were already at boiling point, could now prompt an all-out regional war. Let's bring in Avi Melamed here. He's a geopolitical intelligence analyst and advisor on Arab affairs to the former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. Welcome to the program. Avi, given the assassination of the Hamas leader in Tehran, how concerned should Israelis be about retaliation from Iran? Thank you for having me. Yes, we should be very concerned. It's very likely there is going to be a retaliation. Um, Iran has different tools and means to carry out such uh, retaliation, so it will be very reasonable to expect that. 
I want to ask you about Hezbollah in a moment. I know you've uh, been uh, you've very it's been studying them a lot, but first let me ask you, as a former intelligence officer, what your thoughts are on why Ismail Haniyeh might have been targeted in Tehran. Well, there are a couple of reasons. First, uh, Haniyeh was uh, the head of uh, Hamas political bureau. He was, um, though he was portrayed in Western media as a kind of like more of the moderate guy, he was not a moderate at all. He was a bitter enemy of the state of Israel. He was also uh, in charge of the, among other things, among other people, um, the planning of the October 7 massacre in Israel. Israel has a policy, uh, roughly speaking, going back uh, almost 50 years ago, uh, following the uh, the massacre of Israeli sports um, athletes in Munich, in Germany, uh, that Israel basically has a policy that says such people that are involved in such thing of killing Israelis are basically becoming a legitimate target for um, eliminations. As for itself, elimination of people, individual, is not for itself a strategic uh, uh, objective. And most of the times, it doesn't really serve strategically. Sometimes it has more of symbolical uh, meaning, uh, operational, tactic meaning, not beyond that. But sometimes when you take out figures, like, for example, Hania, it goes beyond, beyond uh, that level. Now, let's talk about Hezbollah in neighboring Lebanon. Uh, you know the group well. What are you hearing about Hezbollah's likely military reaction to the killing of its military leader earlier? Well, I would say that the Hezbollah, like the Iranians, uh, on the one hand, of course, are very incentivized and motivated to retaliate and probably will. They do have, however, some sort of a dilemma. The dilemma is how to retaliate in a way that, on the one hand, will convey a message that actually uh, rehabilitate their uh, smashed or damaged uh, deterrence capacities or image following these two assassinations that happened in a gap of a couple of hours. How to do it in a way that will restore that, on the one hand, but on the other hand, would not, would not um, um, spark a, a dynamic that could result in a whole out war because the basic as assessment or evaluation is that neither of the sides in the end of the day has real interest in such a whole out war. But once you are igniting such a process, you don't really have the ability to fully control it. And therefore there is a risk that it will result in a dynamic that leading in the end of the day to something you don't want to be to start with. So this is the dilemma of uh, Iran and Hezbollah, and they will, right now, there is uh, no doubt that they are basically consulting, put it this way, what will be the right way for Hezbollah to retaliate. I will emphasize that in the end of the day, the final decision about the, the features, the, um, the characteristic uh, of such a retaliation will be uh, decided in Iran, uh, taking into consideration the different possible ramifications of that. Well, everyone, of course, is wondering what will happen next. Uh, retaliation is seems to be factored into most people's calculations. But Hezbollah is in Lebanon, right next door to Israel in the north across the border. Is a military response from them more concerning to Israel than retaliation by Iran, which is over a thousand kilometers away? In any case, uh, the retaliation is very concerning. We, we have to remember, we are looking at Iran and its proxies, the Hezbollah, the Houthis, the Iraqi Shiite militias. They are all massively armed by the best of the weapons the Iranians can offer them, and they offer them, which includes missiles and cruise missiles and attacking drones. We are familiar with all those things, and those things are causing a significant damage. We just remember the Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago that basically um, smashed to some period of time a uh, part of the Iranian oil industry. So they can cause Israel a very, very significant damage, regardless in the end of the day of the distance. Obviously, as you mentioned accurately, Hezbollah is closer to Israel. We are talking about shorter range and, and other aspects, but in the end of the day, the damage could, could be caused by attacking Israel's strategic infrastructure, ports and, and other national infrastructure, that damage could be enormously significant. So from every possible perspective, there is a good reason for Israel to be concerned and to be prepared. So given all that, what can you tell us about the factors that are influencing decisions involving Israel's military at this point? 
Well, I think that the overarching um, guiding line has to do with the with a perspective that I would say is more uh, geostrategic, uh, regionally speaking. Look, we, we are looking at something that has been brewing for many years. And what we see today, or for a long period of time, is actually part of a long-term, sophisticated Iranian master plan to eliminate the state of Israel, in not through the use of non-conventional weapon, but through the use of conventional weapon. And to that extent, the Iranian regime has a very effective tool in its service. And these are the different militias across the Middle East that the Iranian regime funds and arms and provide the military know-how and so on. Hezbollah and Hamas and Islamic Jihad, Shiite Iraqi militias, the Houthis and so on and so on. And this whole master plan of the Mullah regime in the end of the day is supposed to be simultaneously activated from different arenas to basically eliminate Israel in a massive um, a military blow from all directions. Up, up until that moment, as part of the Iranian regime, a major component of this program is to exhaust Israel through a long-term process. And this is exactly what was Hamas and Islamic Jihad role for the last couple of decades. Israel has been dealing with Hamas and Islamic Jihad for the last 40 years, and this is part of this long-term Iranian master plan. So what we saw is an ongoing, clearly, process of exhausting Israel through these military rounds carried out by the Iranian proxies, targeting deliberately, knowingly, and intentionally Israel's soft belly, which are the civilians. And the whole purpose of that is basically to bring Israel down to its knees to the point where the massive final blow would basically eliminate Israel. Right now, what we see in this region is the reshuffle of the game cards. Israel basically sends the message in the last couple of hours, the 24 hours, Israel sent the message that says, we are now changing the ground rules and, and we now decide what's going to be the pace and the trajectory. Basically, mm -hmm. Israel says like, we are not willing any longer to take this story of exhaustion. Now it's time for decision. And one of the potential possible outcome of that very dramatic shift, I would say, is the possibility that indeed the region will find itself in an all-out uh, war as an outcome of that, of that shift. But this is something that didn't happen because of the last 24 hours. In the end of the day, we are looking at a long-term process. The aggression of the Iranian regime was for too long ignored. Uh, by the Western policymakers, they basically were kicking this can down the road. But in the end of the day, it was inevitable. Because if you don't deal with the bully when he's little, you are going to deal with the bully when he's big and stronger. And this is exactly what we see today. And this is exactly when we hear today about a major concern globally about the possibility of a whole out war in the region, which okay. is very possible to do. Avi, thank you very much for your insights. That was Avi Melamed, a geopolitical intelligence analyst. With the Hamas leader assassinated in Tehran, emotions in Iran and elsewhere are running high in the region. So will emotions dictate what happens next, or will cooler heads prevail? I put that question to Middle East analyst Guido Steinberg from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. No, I do expect that uh, emotions in Tehran and in Beirut will have an influence on, on decision making, uh, especially the fact that Hania was uh, killed in the heart of the Iranian capital um, on the occasion of the swearing in of President Pezeshkian uh, will probably force um, the Iranian leadership um, to take some countermeasures, possibly together with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Well, Israel does now have a new, more moderate president. Uh, he was just sworn in on Tuesday. Does that matter in this situation? Does he, does he have a say in what happens next? No. The, the president sits on the National Security Security Council in Tehran, uh, but he doesn't have a uh, major influence. Uh, the people who will decide was it, what is happening next are uh, first and foremost uh, the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, and his most senior military uh, and intelligence uh, advisors. Uh, Pezeshkian is probably a voice that is heard, 
uh, in among these people, but he's only a minor voice. So we should expect uh, the the military, uh, including including Khamenei, who is very uh, close to the military in in Iran, um, to take the decision. How do you see this playing out, Gita? What are you expecting in the coming days and weeks? Well, I do expect uh, some military attacks, military terrorist attacks on the part of Iran and or Hezbollah on, on Israel. Um, many observers now talk about a direct Iranian uh, uh, attack on Israel with cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and drones, just like the one that we have seen uh, on the 13th of April. I'm not that convinced that Iran will choose this option simply uh, because uh, the, last, uh, the last action was not, not a major success. I'm uh, more worried about uh, attacks, again, by cruise missiles, drones, and ballistic missiles from Lebanon, if, Le uh, if uh, Hezbollah now decides to escalate its attack attacks, perhaps start an attack on military targets uh, a little bit further down south, close to Haifa, for example, uh, then we might see uh, a major Israeli counter reaction and the beginning of a war. I think we should expect uh, more to come in the next weeks.